All right. I'm here with my good friend right up the street from me right now, Doug Bonaparte. Thank you for joining me, sir. How are you? Hey, Tyrone. I'm good. It's a nice yeah. day. Really it hot. Is. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like I should have just driven up the highway and we could have shot this in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This umbrella is saving my life right now. Yeah, man. Um, so again, let, let's dig right in because, you know, there's a bunch of stuff you and I could cover. Um, and, and one of the things that I always tell people I've admired when I was at a wirehouse, um, looking at you on, on social media and, and how you decided you were going to hold yourself out as an advisor to millennials and things like that. Everyone knows that that's out there. They can go look that up. But let's really talk about growth for you just in terms of, right, we, we always banter about in our calls about effective ways to grow and the best ways to grow and responsible ways to grow. But what have you found most effective that a young advisor or any new advisor um, would find, you know, fruitful as they start to grow their practices and endeavor to be as, you know, um, pronounced and successful as you are now? Well, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> two things. I think there's two things I could uh, put out there that will help um, young advisors who are looking to grow. The first one is time. Um, and the second one's credibility. And you're going to need both of those, right? And you need time in order to get the credibility. But I think what I've learned over the last 16 years of being in the profession is just that. It took 16 years to get where I am right now. There's no overnight success story. Um, the way that the profession has evolved from its brokerage days to where we are now as comprehensive financial planners that deliver planning and advice related services and investments Second, that's my philosophy. Mm -hmm. The fundamental difference here is you can't cold call people. And I know you did an amazing job of doing that at the White House. Shout it can be cold callers. Yeah. <laughs> so real quick, real quick on that before you make me eat those words is that is a really tough thing to do. It's a tough numbers game. You're, you know, and I, I would attribute a lot of your success in doing that to the fact that you have the stamina, the durability. You're an athlete. Like this is programmed into you. Um, and a lot of people just aren't conditioned for that kind of thing. And it's a mismatch to where the value that we deliver is today. I think that's the more important mm -hmm. point. True. And I agree. You so, so jumping out of school and becoming a financial advisor or financial planner in the sense of delivering advice and value, you know, the value through advice and planning isn't going to happen in six months of graduation, a year, three, maybe five. It depends on how you go about that. And what you're looking for here is a runway and patience. You're playing a long game from day one. So that's number one is you need time and figure out how, how are you going to buy that time? How are you going to get that time? There's a lot of entry points in the profession that don't really provide the type of time that you need to mature. And, and look, a lot of this is just maturing as a person. Like you're coming out into mm -hmm. this at 23, 24, 25. I see all these gray hairs. <laughs> right? So, it's, it's just literally evolving as a person and understanding how people work and what they need and seeing financial lives evolve and getting good at that. It's experiential. So time is, is number one. And while you're, so I'll stop there, make sure that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'll keep going with that. So time is a massive one. And then the second thing is the credibility. I think if you are young and I'm speaking specifically to young advisors here, um, there's no shortage of financial professionals of all kinds, like over 360,000 financial service professionals in the United States. That's everyone from, you know, the bank teller to, you know, your wirehouse broker to your investment advisor at your multi-billion dollar RIA. So it's pretty broad universe of what we consider financial professionals. How are you going to get credibility for your own brand, your own being, your own person as an advisor? So when you go out there, there's really no doubt as to whether or not, you know, you're, you're qualified. So uh, from an academic or um, learning point of view, so CFP designations, any designation that really caters to what it is you might want to specialize in. It could be divorce. It could be estate planning, tax, you name it. You can go broad. You can go very specific there. So credibility in that form. I've chosen not only to get those credentials, whether it be through a CFP or grad school, and there's no set path here, right? I, I chose to like just go after as much as I could in the beginning, because I really didn't have that, you know, I'm going to focus on millennials, you know, and, and go niche. 
as far as what the focus would be. Yeah. But then what I eventually did is decided to do credibility through um, PR and uh, the media. So I leveraged New York City and access to uh, financial media outlets and the press and being able to link up with them and build a broad network of that to basically amass credibility, not just with, you know, the years of service, but also with, oh my God, look, he, he got a line. That's just that one line. How about you do a podcast? How about you take that podcast like we're doing here on that line and then share it on your blog or put it out on social media. And if you get into the repetition of doing this year in and year out and start amassing, you know, um, just your name being around, you know, the credibility play there is going to stand out. And that's how I've managed to grow. And I think growing as a young advisor is the absolute hardest thing to do. It's the hardest part of this entire business, cracking that code, finding out the way you're going to grow. You get that right. You're on your way. Yeah. You are on, yeah. you are just on your way. You're loving this. That didn't happen for me until maybe where I felt confident, like there was a growth machine that like leads could come in offline or people were calling for you. And you tell a lot of young people that's going to take 10 years plus they're going to run for the hills right? That's the long game we're talking about. And again, bringing it back to this mismatch between the way most of the profession recruits and brings in its talent and the desire to be productive sooner than later. I get it. It's a business. You got to produce. You got to help with the top line if you're going to be an advisor. I, I won't sugarcoat that. At the end of the day, you need to bring in clients, right? That's what we're talking about growth here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying you need to, you know, make a million dollars a year. How many advisors out there making 50, 60, 70, 80,000 yeah. living amazing lives, right? Ge geographically based, all of these things. So, you know, those are the two biggest things that I could think of here in the time that we have that young advisors should focus on. Again, time and credibility. And now we can talk about whatever you want you know, in the context of those two things or anything else you really want to talk about. Yeah, I, de I definitely want to do that. And I want to hit on this note because especially, you know, some of the, some of the conversations that we've had, you know, personally and just what you're seeing now is every advisor wants that line in the Wall Street Journal, right? Or, the, or Barron's, right? Or you want to be quoted in an article. That's like, oh, right. Now that's its own beast, right? And it comes with a lot, you know, once you start to have a large profile like you have on social media and being on TV, what will be your advice to advisors in terms of that? Should they have their own PR person? Should they just try and do good work and then let it come? Or, you know, should they actually work with some type of agency or someone, you know, or just follow like Samantha Russell? Or, like, what, what, what do you think? And again, there's, I, I don't know if there's a right or a wrong answer here, but you've done this well. So what would you say for the average advisor that they should be doing to kind of get a media presence if that's what they desire to do and do it effectively? Right, right. And it's a big if. And, and I would just kind of double down on that point right there, which is you don't have to do this. There's plenty of ways to grow. We're talking about, you know, one way that I've discovered to grow. But if you are going to pursue uh, the media strategy, one thing I want to address, if you are so fortunate enough to earn your lines or get a byline in a prestigious uh, masthead like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you name it, whatever your local news, by the way, very, going hyper local often will yep. do more damage mm -hmm. than anything at the national level. I happen to be in New York City and the surrounding area. So that, put, you know, it made my life a little bit more difficult, to be honest with you. You're, you're trying to knock on the door of, of the big media organizations. You know, you, if, if you live in, I'm going to pick on Wichita, like you have far greater access to your local reporters, yeah. producers, and editors than you do at, you know, the national level. And again, you're, you're focusing on your own, you know, getting clients locally. So starting with that in mind, what I suggest, so the, sorry, the first thing I'm going to say is if you do get that line, please know nothing's going to change. Like that first line will literally True. do nothing. If, if you're waiting for the phone to ring because your name, you want to know who's calling you? Your mother. Your mother is calling you to say she is very proud of you. Um, and by the way, you had already told her you were going to be in it. She's, exactly. you know, she's replying to the email you sent her of the line. So let's just be real with that. But I think that if, if you're just looking for you know, again, long games here. If you're looking for that instant success of, oh, I got my name, I'm, I'm legitimized. No, you got to then use that. 
like the any advisor's website as seen on, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Listen, that could be as many as 500 different media hits that I've amassed over six years, or it could be five hits from five publications and you can put on your website as seen in. That's good marketing. That's good marketing that lends itself to credibility. That could be your step one. Step two, you go deeper with that, right? You can create an entire blog post around one sentence you got in an article about 401ks or college mm -hmm. planning. Let me break down this article. Here's what I agreed with and I disagreed with, or here's how we do this at our firm. It was great to be featured here. That sounds campy cheesy, but you get good at this. You want it to feel natural. You can take any third party content that you've been a part of and turn it into first party content and put that out to your clients, put that out to prospects, and that's credibility right? Your clients now know you've been in something special and they're going to tell their friends when they're saying, oh, who's your advisor? My guy or girl is, or man or woman, is the one that was featured in the paper here the other day, right? You were reading the local news about that thing. So there you go. That's how you, know, you can make this work for you and get the credibility out of getting that one line. Now, as far as doing it on your own, versus hiring someone to do it. I think it's just what's natural to you. And, you know, anytime it comes to hiring someone to do something, it's just a look inside to see, are you good at this? or Are you not good at this? And I think when it comes to just marketing in general, there's the stigma and maybe it's backed up with some truth. Advisors aren't really good at marketing. It's a different hat. The right. best advisors right. sometimes um, are the best marketers right? Because it's about growing that top line and getting business in the door. Yes, you need to run a good business. You need to be a good advisor, but the best marketers, they're the ones making uh, the most client acquisition, you know, happen for them almost at any time. So for me, I actually have a public relations degree. Um, it's something that I studied in college. Little did I know I would parlay that into my actual marketing strategy as an advisor. So I got lucky there. I have no problem like you know, pushing the envelope, knocking on doors, you know, shooting a DM to a reporter or suggesting a good idea and, and, you know, being professional about that. You know, you can be, you can be a professional pest, you know, and, and what, what <laughs> that you are. <laughs> yes. They say persistence overcomes resistance. resistance. There you go. So, you know, and I've even written a blog post about working with the media where I got all the report, like these are top notch editor reporters in the financial space. I flipped the script on them and I said, all right, I'm writing an article. I'm interviewing you. What are you looking for when it comes to being a great source to so go check out working with the media over on the blog and you'll see what they had to say it's some pretty straightforward rules that could get you your first bylines and then you can turn that in so it's a huge process that you can put together if you're so real quick if you're going to hire someone to do this there's nothing wrong with that i've taken the time and i have the ability to go you know build out that network on my own you can pay for that Right? If you're busy growing in other ways or you've you got other issues to deal with in your practice, you're building out compliance, you're writing your ADD, you're just getting your feet off the ground. And the last thing you have you know, is time in your schedule to master you know, uh, public relations. You can hire people for this. Be mindful of the budget. Know that no one promises you anything, but a lot of these folks are very good at what they do. They have great contacts. Getting you a line you know, might initially look like the best thing ever. It's just the line. So just be cautious when working with people. Make sure you understand what the value is you're getting. And I think you really, um, I think you really get extract value when you use their ability to get your foot in the door and then you yourself take it to that next step. Remember, you hired them. They're not going to rep your brand like you're going to rep your brand. I think anyone who runs a business knows how hard it is to incentivize even your employees even the employees with equity to work as hard as you will with your baby, right? And I've experienced that and you've experienced that. And I think anyone who's ever worked in an organization where they wanted equity or received equity knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, man, you full of jewels today, my goodness. So before we get you out of here, right, we are in a very interesting time in the world, period. No need to go down that rabbit hole. But let's go in our little myopic world here, which is financial advisory and wealth management. In, in spite of everything that's going on, you, we have friends, again, uh, you know, a lot of folks are growing their practices now, right? They're, they're growing, they're, 
they're getting referrals. And again, I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of because it simply means that you are demonstrating value and have demonstrated value. So what would you say, you know, moving forward, right? Again, to, to an advisor that may be ashamed about that. And then the others, like, what is it? Two parts, right? What, what would you say to that advisor that may be ashamed to, you know, not broadcast it, oh, I'm killing it, but just be able to speak to that. And then the other part is, what does this look like moving forward, right? Do, do advisors still continue to grow as people start to get evicted and these moratoriums are lifted? Um, what, what does that look like for our space as we continue you know, to, to serve people, but also the result of that serving is, again, growing um, our actual practices in, in, our, you know, in our brands in uh, a really volatile and, turn, in, you know, uh, tumultuous time. Yeah. I see where you're coming from. And we, we actually talked about this specific thing for a little bit uh, a few weeks ago, as far as, um, you know, advisors that were experiencing tremendous growth during difficult times. So the first thing I'll say is this: if, if you're in the business of growing um, a financial planning or wealth management practice, and you fail to understand that it's during the tough times that you're probably going to grow the most mm -hmm. you don't want to be that person it's like i can't no one wants to hear from the person that's like i can't wait for things to get bad so i can grow more i think there's a right. difference in that that's yeah you're not going to want to broadcast that you don't even want to be that person that's not cool but there's a difference between that and knowing that when things get wild and things get tough that's when people, when they feel uncomfortable or they feel scared, they want to go get advice. They want to alleviate themselves of that fear, anxiety, and concern. And that's why if you're credible, if you did great marketing and you put your name out there, that's why you're going to get more calls at this time in a cycle, in an economy than any other time. All right. So let's make sure we separate those two very distinct things. Now, the shame and the feelings you get from doing a good job while things appear to be and really are not that good, right? So this uh, dichotomy of the economy and the market, the wealthy, the haves and the have-nots and the divide that's further being created here, and those feelings are certainly real. For me to be at home, I'll get real here, for me to be at home and to be able to be with my girls and figure out a schedule that works and grow my business, is there a survivor, you know, this is survivor's guilt. This is when your grandpa would come home from World War II, right, and feel guilty that he was alive and not his homies that he grew up playing stickball with. Right, right. right. So those feelings are real. It parlays into um, imposter syndrome. But you got to, you know, you got to sort that out. This ain't going to be a full-fledged psychology, you know, session here today. But, but I think that's natural. I think that, you know, very motivated and successful people get a lot of these feelings as they continue to do well. I know I do. It, it, it doesn't feel good. And it feels even worse when you are self-aware enough to know that there are vast parts of our society and country truly mm -hmm. suffering right now. So again, like compare that to I'm working with, you know, well, you know, hardworking, high velocity, high achieving young professionals. Not a lot of them have gotten laid off yet and hopefully won't have, you know, had the ability to build um, cash reserves to keep themselves safe over the last four or five years. Now, look, they had a good advisor saying, hey, in the good times, we prepare for the bad right? Anyone, anyone can prepare for rougher times in the good times. That's completely relative, right? We tr you try at least. But anyways, if that's the message and you were fortunate enough to do that, you hit this bad time and you might find yourself doing better, relatively speaking, than whoever the, compar the comparable is, right? And then as a business owner, as a real human being, you push back on all of that and, you know, the feelings start to, to come out here. And you yeah. handle them, you handle them like an adult and you realize right. what's important to you in your life. You take solace in knowing that you're helping people. You know, dad always said this business is having the mind of a capitalist and the heart of a social worker. 
So you take some solace in knowing that you're helping people with their lives, right? If you're only doing upscale, go do pro bono. Go take that 30 minute, 15 minute call to someone who's not a good fit for your practice and hook them up, make the content, direct them to your site and say, here's everything you need. You don't need to pay me a thousand, two thousand dollars to put together a plan. That kind of thinking will pay you back throughout the rest of your career. You'd be surprised to see how many people you helped early on are going to come back to you and be a happy paying client or customer because you were there for them no matter what was going on at a rough time, at a good time. Look, man, there are people having a bad time in the best of times. So, right. you know, those are all the things you can do, how you can handle those feelings. They're real. I will acknowledge them. So yeah, you know, don't, don't, um, don't head out there on social media and, and be unaware that perhaps saying, you know, oh, I'm absolutely crushing it these last four months. Anyone else experiencing this? It's like, listen, slide into your homies DMs, see what's going on with their business. That ain't a, that ain't a broadcasting thing. You know, that's definitely some, some signaling. That's a little virtue signaling for me. But look, I, I, at the same time, I also understand that if, if you're a young advisor and this is like the first time like you're seeing the dividends of your hard work and you just want to share that out there think of the um, we talked about it we talked about constructive ways to go ahead and communicate that might might be more of an internal communication to your clients who care more about that stuff than the public right yeah absolutely no man you're killing it so again it's super helpful and this is why i i think this show is is built for folks like you because there's so many young advisors that can just take away from this 10, 15 minutes of conversation. So where do they go to find you? We, we know it's Twitter, but where else can they go to reach you and, and uh, yeah. a little bit? Yeah, yeah, you can always go to the stand-up comedy show. That is Twitter and, <laughs> and check out Doug Bonaparte. So there I'm half advisor, half, half stand-up comedian. Check out bonafidewealth.com. Want to keep it professional, hit up LinkedIn. Literally Doug Douglas Bonaparte on any search engine will we'll bring you in. If, if, if it didn't, then everything I said here, you know. <laughs> Ain't real. <laughs> right. As for us, you know the drill. Please run to YouTube um, and search Altruist. Go to the Altruist page, like, subscribe, and share. There you will find the Human Advisor Podcast. Uh, learn with Brittany Castro, our Learn mentors, Alex Telekian and Desarte Yarnway. Cannot let you all go without saying there is some big news coming on the growth front as well. Thank you all that have been supporting the last couple of months, but we do got some big news coming. Mr. Bonaparte, I appreciate you, sir, for your time. And we'll see you all in the next one. I appreciate you.